Labvakar cenījumies skatītājiet arā šodienas jautājums, un Krievija ir zaudējusi jau daudzus citus karus, kāpēc lai tā nezaudētu arī šo. Tā jaunais Polijas ārlietu ministrs, kur šajās dienās ir vizītē Rīgā, un tāpēc šī vakara saruna gan netiešaidē, bet ierakstā dienas vidū šeit Latvijas okupācijas muzejā tieši ar viņu, ar Radoslavu Sikorski. Hello and thank you for having this conversation with us. You have probably heard that about a month ago, a Molotov's cocktail was thrown into here directly in our uh, museum's uh, director's office. No coincidence, of course. Do you see provocations of Russia like this in Poland? Well, I commiserated with the director on this act of uh, sabotage. Uh, Russia is again on an imperial path, and it is no coincidence that it tries to wipe out the history of Russian and Soviet persecutions in Russia and in the former colonies. Um, uh, they uh, destroyed the um, monuments to uh, the concentration camps in Russia and they finally banned Memorial uh, just before the uh, invasion of Ukraine. This is no coincidence. Uh, they want to control the past in order to control the future, but they'll fail. Let's hope so, but so your guess would be that they not only tried to draw attention here, but actually to burn the place down with all the memories it in really it? It really bothers them that the um, uh, evidence of their crimes is maintained. You see, my wife wrote the uh, history of the Gulag based on KGB archives, but she was only able to do it in the 1990s when those archives were open. She couldn't write that book today because the, as Russia closed down, so did the archives close down. This is not a coincidence. And now we see the new war crimes of Russia and uh, not so long ago Emmanuel Macron, I would say surprised his uh, NATO allies by uh, saying that it's not excluded that some NATO countries could actually send their troops to Ukraine. Uh, in order to prevent Russia from winning this war. It was followed by many statements that NATO has no intention in doing that. I think one of them was from your Prime Minister as well. And still you said that the presence of NATO forces in Ukraine is not unthinkable. In what possible scenario do you actually see that happening? Well, you see, we are peace-loving democracies. We actually would like just to be left to ourselves. Uh, uh, we have no aggressive designs against anybody because we are happy within our own borders, right? Whereas Russia is a revisionist power, which is unhappy with its borders, which wants to rebuild the empire. Um, and so w at every stage of this conflict, our leaders have been saying, you know, we don't want war, we just want to maintain the rules. But what we see as maintaining some kind of rules-based order, Putin sees as weakness. Uh, and so he sees us self-limiting um, ourselves in our options. And what I see President Macron doing is um, signaling to Putin that we can also do something that you don't expect. And I share the spirit of that. So are you sure that behind the signal there is that readiness to actually go through with it? Well, Ukraine is a victim of aggression. It's a democratic country. It has the right to invite people to help them defend it themselves from an act of aggression. Um, we are still a defensive alliance. And the best proof that Putin understands that NATO is not a threat to him is that uh, he has removed troops from the neighborhood of Latvia and, for example, from the Kaliningrad Oblast exclave. Uh, and he's put everything he's got against Ukraine. Um, but we also have options, you know, as NATO, we exercise. Uh, uh, we've done things that Putin didn't, uh, didn't expect. I don't think that when he was preparing to launch this war, he expected us to send our arms to Ukraine or he expected us to impose effective sanctions on Russia. Uh, he has underestimated the resilience of democracies and he continues to underestimate it. And still, this is not only about Putin, but of course of our societies as well. And as long as, of course, Poland, together with Latvia and other Baltic states, have indeed been the truest friends to Ukraine, there's no doubt about that. Do you really think that Polish people would ever support sending your troops to 
um, Ukraine if it, that actually meant and that could be that the case, well, attack from Russia. Polish troops is a slightly different issue uh, and the reason our uh, Prime Minister excluded it is because the, uh, we and Ukraine were the same country for 400 years and the Russians are trying to build up a case that Poland has designs on Ukraine which is absurd. But because of these historic reasons, we should be the last, because we don't want to feed the Russian propaganda. Uh, but in principle, others uh, have the right to help Ukraine. Germany said, says we should be the last and they are not sending their towers. Well, they have, they have a history of that too, you know. Uh, but um, but uh, we, have sent, we have helped Ukraine much more than the Russians ever expected. Uh, Poland actually recently had a Russian missile uh, flying into your airspace for a minute and you summoned uh, the Russian ambassador to give some explanations and he didn't come. Does he still have a place in Poland? I think he uh, fulfills a very uh, useful role of reminding us of the arrogance <laughs> of uh, previous uh, Russian imperial and then Soviet diplomacy uh, he, um, uh, by, uh, by, by being as arrogant as he is, he reminds us what we are resisting. But he stays there, he stays in Poland. Well, we have diplomatic relations. Uh, we don't anymore in this level here in Latvia. Right, well, we do. Um, uh, this, uh, this missile was the third or fourth that has breached uh, um, uh, Polish airspace. We, of course, uh, um, uh, maintain our right to self-defense uh, and we will, when we want to make an answer, it'll, you know, it's not going to be at the level of an arrogant ambassador. Uh, I mentioned already Germany and the Taurus missiles. Uh, we just also read in Financial Times that the White House might have asked uh, Ukraine to stop targeting the Russian energetic uh, energy infrastructure to avoid response and not to drive the oil prices up. Um, not to mention the forever delayed uh, US help from Congress and we don't know what will happen after the election. With all this in mind, why would you think, what makes you think, if some, something still does, that the West will ever do enough for Ukraine to win this war? This is an excellent question that should be posed to the United States. Do you still think that West will do enough for Ukraine? Well, uh, Poland is an indispensable uh, a logistical hub. The great majority of the ammunition uh, that goes to help Ukraine goes through Poland. And I can tell you, it's still going to Ukraine. So yes, we, Ukraine needs more. And we've joined the Czech ammunition initiative and there is the European Peace Facility and then there are bilateral programs. They all go through Poland. And, of course, the American package is, is badly needed, uh, but it's not as if nothing is going through. Yeah, of course, it's not like that. And the question also wasn't about uh, that Poland should do more. Everyone should do more, but Poland is doing really a lot. But do you believe that enough will be done for Ukraine to win this war? Look, as we um, agreed with uh, Latvia's excellent uh, foreign minister, um, if everybody else did what Poland and Latvia are doing, Ukraine would be in a, in a better position than it is today. And of course it's not only about American, uh, European Union here, we also have some countries. Slova Slovakia is now one of those who uh, have publicly said that they don't see that this conflict has military solutions and yet I will say that after the change of government in Slovakia, has, it has switched not only its attitude towards Ukraine, there is also a big concern about how they are treating the public media, uh, cutting the budget, uh, changing the board members. How would you say, how is it different? Is it different from what you did in Poland after the change of government? Well, we had a, a, a populist um, detour in Slovakia before. Uh, and the previous Slovak government was actually very helpful uh, to, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, but when you say, when somebody is being attacked, that um, you want peace and there is no military solution, but you're not going to help the victim militarily, what, are, what you are in fact saying is that the victim should capitulate. 
and we don't think uh, Ukraine should capitulate. We think uh, Russia should withdraw its troops from Ukraine. Of course. And, so. and, and Russia withdrawing its troops from Ukraine, which could be done with a phone call, is the only way to permanent stable peace. Uh, of course, and, uh, and still I'm sure you noticed that I asked also about public media and uh, what happened in Poland drew a lot of attention as well. Do you say that what you did after the change of government somehow differs from what uh, happens in Slovakia right now? I don't follow the state of Slovak media that closely, but I, I know that populist governments try to... Uh, uh, they, always, they usually start with the Constitutional Tribunal and then go for uh, public media, security services. You know, there is a sort of uh, a playbook of how you capture the state. Um, in Poland, with the last election, um, <coughs> we averted uh, Poland sliding towards uh, uh, autocracy. Um, and we believe that the way we won the elec election against... Uh, against our populists it should be an inspiration to others. Uh, and, and look, I can only say that, uh, that the populists uh, propose simple solutions to difficult problems the, under the guise of populism and ideology, what, you, what you're usually getting is mass thieving by a part of the elite. But in your case, would you say that the end justified the means? Can you avert the bad done uh, by your previous uh, opponents by using the same methods? Like oh, no, no. of course not. But these are not the same methods. You see, public media in most countries, certainly in Poland, had a um, legal duty to be impartial, to be apolitical, to present facts to be outside of party control. So under the previous government, uh, it, the uh, public media in Poland were in breach of their charter. They were actually breaking the law. We've, we've just brought them back to normal, which is to try to be fact-based and to be, uh, to be more balanced. Um, that's not the same. Sure, some, pa some party propagandists lose their jobs, but these people were not journalists. They were, they were media functionaries of the ruling party. Have you had to explain something of this to your European allies or do you understand? Actually, they, they get it, you know, it became so outrageous. Let me give you an example. Um, our uh, previous and current Prime Minister, Donald Tusk, was head of EPP, the largest, the Christian Democrat uh, grouping in the European Parliament. And in that role, he addressed national congresses of various EPP parties. And being a good politician, he would weave in a few sentences in their native language, including to the CDU. And he told them, good luck in your deliberations. Don't think only of what's good for, for Germany, für Deutschland, but think of what's good for Europe. Okay? So actually, he was telling the Germans not to be selfish. These two words, Führer Deutschland, were shown hundreds of times on the main uh, evening news of Polish state TV under the previous government. It was Goebbelsian propaganda. Another topic where uh, Poland has drawn a lot of uh, international uh, attention lately, it is the former farmers' uh, protests all around Poland, of course, uh, also blocking the uh, border with Ukraine. Why would you let that happen, blocking the border with Ukraine, knowing how extremely important delivery route it is for Ukraine? Uh, first of all, I'm sure you know that the border is not blocked for military shipments and for humanitarian aid. Our farmers are, are blocking some of the agricultural trade. Which is important for Ukraine to continue. Which is important for Ukraine. But remember the origins. So. Um, Ukraine is not yet a member of the European Union, and we are an agricultural cartel. We protect the European market uh, in, in the area of agriculture. But when Putin invaded and he blocked the Ukrainian shipments through the Black Sea, we all, uh, in an act of solidarity with Ukraine, said, right, you can't send your grain to Africa via the Bosphorus. You can do it 
uh, we're opening uh, the gates. Okay? And this worked for a while, but it also meant that two-thirds of the Ukrainian grain remained in Poland. And what's happened since then is that Ukraine has won the battle of the Western Black Sea. And Ukrainian grain is now flowing again to its traditional market. And, and, and we are preparing to start negotiations with, the, with Ukraine on them joining the single market. But during the negotiations, we can't have this, this uh, emergency measure because it actually means that Ukraine it has been admitted to the single market without negotiations, without quotas, without a transitional period, and without having to fulfill all the European norms. So I'm afraid we have to go back to, to uh, the previous system and then negotiate Ukraine's entry. Are you sure that when Ukraine actually comes close to becoming a European uh, Union uh, member, there won't be new protests from Polish partners? I, th I, 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 I sympathize with the premise of your question. They, we have just realized what a great challenge Ukrainian membership will be to the common agricultural policy. I don't know what the average land holding in Latvia is, but in Poland, uh, the average land holding is 11 hectares. Half the soil in Ukraine is owned by these agro holdings, the smallest of which is 10,000 hectares. So you see, Ukrainian, Ukrainian membership in the common agricultural policy will be a huge challenge. And we just can't do it from one day to the next. This, take, this will take time and some hard-headed negotiations. But the support from Poland will remain. The support for Poland strategically and politically for Ukrainian membership will remain. Well, it's still a question whether you will continue to allow transit from Ukraine to, uh, through Poland. But here in Latvia, it's a big debate right now about the magnesium transit through Latvia to Russia. Uh, since it can be used also for uh, weapon production. And um, our officials say that, well, if there is not a complete ban in European Union, that we should at least come to an agreement here in the region, uh, Baltic states, Finland and Poland. Would Poland agree? Well, the ban to be effective has, the, has to be an EU ban. And we have tightened uh, sanctions on Russia. We are now on the 13th or 14th package of sanctions. And this is coming through? which we have to uh, effectively enforce. And we are coming close to the situation in which actually we could flip the issue, namely to say uh, what is allowed uh, to be traded with Russia, rather, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the exceptions. Uh, uh, this was a, a subject of an important conversation today with my Latvian colleague. You would support this? Just a few exceptions and that's all. Uh, look, uh, th there are precedents. So if I understand correctly, uh, with Iran, there is a general ban, except for food and pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And even then, you know, there are some breaches. Uh, we need to uh, 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 use our sanctions politically to achieve political aims of depriving Putin of the resources to continue his war of aggression. And still, if we look at the map, there are only so many countries who have a border with uh, Russia, with uh, Belarus. We could come to an agreement of our own, not waiting for uh, Hungary to make their decision. No, I believe that these have to be EU decisions because we are members of the customs union and the single market. So what we do affects others. Uh, n no, I think... Uh, uh, an EU decision is much more effective than a national one. So, so if Latvia comes to you with this propose, proposal, you, you will say no? Uh, on the contrary, uh, I find these, uh, these uh, creative ideas uh, to which we need to persuade our, the rest of our colleagues. Actually, here in Latvia, lately there has been a big public pressure to end any business with Russia at all. Exporting, importing, is it something Poland would ever even consider? Uh, we need to discuss this further, uh, but Russia has defined itself and talks every day about us being their enemy. This has consequences. Still we know that there are some European Union countries which will never stop doing 
business with Russia completely. And if we say that we have to wait for their approval, isn't it a way of saying that we won't do that as well? Well, that's the deal, that it takes a little longer, but once you get the agreement, it's much more effective. You know, the European Union is not composed only of, of Latvias and Poland's. <laughs> Uh, it takes time to, to reach consensus. Uh, but I think, uh, I have to tell you, bef I knew the war was coming. I'm on the record warning the Ukrainians that the war is coming. And if you told me then um, that the Russian army would underperform, that the Ukrainians will actually defeat them in the field, win in the Black Sea, and then recover 50% of the occupied territories, that the European Union and its member states will supply well over 100 billion euros worth of assistance uh, uh, to Ukraine. I would, not, I would have said, wow, you know, let, let's, let's not be, uh, let, let's, let's remember that we've done better than some of us expected. Yeah, of course, that's really a lot, but it's not enough. We see every day in Ukraine it's not enough. We need to stay the course. Uh, you, Putin has depleted already half of his national reserve fund. He's actually ruining this country in, in, in prosecuting this war. I believe in another two years he will, the Russian economy will be in serious trouble. Will this war end in two years? Uh, this is a colonial war. Uh, they only end uh, when the elite in the metropolis uh, decides that the launching of the war was a mistake and that the objective of the war is not worth the expenditure in blood and treasure that is being sustained. And the Russians are not yet at this point. And we, so we need to impose costs. Do you see them reaching this point after the so-called election, after what happened with Navalny? Uh, this was a subject of my... Um, dispute with the Russian ambassador at the, uh, at the United Nations uh, recently. He claimed that Russia has never been defeated. Well, Russia lost the Crimean War. Russia lost the Russo-Japanese War. Russia was knocked out of World War I. Russia was defeated at the gates of Warsaw in 1920. Russia lost the war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And Russia lost the Cold War. Yes, you can impose enough costs on the Russians for them to give up, and we're in the process of doing it. I think this is a nice place where to end this conversation. Thank Mr. Sikorsky, thank you for this My conversation. Pleasure.